Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, welcome to Lost in Transaction Process Doppelganging. Um, my name is Tal Lieberman, and I'm the security research team leader at Ensilo. With me here is Eugene. Hello, I'm Eugene Kogan, software developer from Ensilo. And today we're going to be talking about um, doppelganging, which is a new evasion technique for, for Windows. And we're going to start off by talking about the history of evasion techniques. Um, we're going to move on to talk about AV scanners and all the different uh, factors to consider when implementing one. Then we're going to discuss transacted NTFS or TXF, as this is known, it's known by Microsoft, and then move on to discuss the evolution of the Windows process loader over the years. Finally, we're going to get to the doppelganging execution flow, followed by a live demo. And then if we have time, we'll discuss a mitigation in Redstone, a story of a blue screen of death that we ran into while uh, conducting this research. So um, advanced code injection techniques and evasion techniques have been with us for, for many years now. Um, notable methods are ghost writing, atom bombing, power loading, propagating, which was only recently released a few weeks ago. Um, we have reflective loading, which is loading of, um, of DLL files into memory without ever placing them on disk. Um, and we have process hollowing, which is basically running a malicious process inside of a container process. So let's take a look at a bunch of these. Um, we'll start off with ghost writing. Uh, this, as the author describes it, is a paradox, writing to another process without opening it nor actually writing to it. And it's an injection technique from actually over a decade ago, from April of 2010, and it hasn't really received much attention, so it's why I decided to cover it in this talk. Um, the goal here is to inject arbitrary code into a process, in this example specifically, uh, explorer.exe, and do that without opening the process, without writing to the process's memory, without creating any threads in the process, or using APCs and whatever. Um, now this technique works by, um, by first finding two patterns in NTDLL. We're going to call them the move pattern and the jump pattern. Now, we're going to use these two patterns to achieve what we call a write what where, which is uh, basically the ability to write whatever we want into the target process's address space and do that into any address that we want. So let's start off by talking about the move pattern. The move pattern is a simple pattern made up of two instructions in assembly code. The one being a move from a, an immediate value stored in a register and then storing that value in the memory pointed to by another register. So an example would be this, where we have move the contents of EBX register into the memory where EAX points to. And now what we want to do is use set thread context API, which controls the registers of, um, of a thread, and set the EAX register to point to an address in memory where we want to write a double word, and then write that double word into EBX, and by that we can write a double word wherever we want in memory. The next thing that will happen is we're going to return, which is uh, the next part of this uh, little gadget here we have. And this return, there's a problem with it because we don't know where it's going to return to. And so what we're going to utilize here is something called the jump pattern. And basically we're just going to look for an instruction that is a jump zero, which means it's going to keep executing itself again and again in an infinite loop. It's going to stick the program, and that way we're going to avoid a crash. And so uh, using some tricks that we're not going to cover right now, we're going to get the return to jump to this uh, to this jump, and everything is covered in this blog post if you're interested. And then this ability enables us to iteratively, one double word at a time, write whatever we want, wherever we want. Now, once we have this uh, write what where ability, you can get creative and think, how can we use this to uh, execute code? In this specific example, the author decided to write a shell code onto the stack of the, um, of the target uh, thread. And then using set thread context, uh, call virtual protect to change the protection of the page, make it executable, and then run shell code. Another injection technique that actually we, re we released uh, about a year ago, which was in October of 2016, is called atom bombing. And that uses uh, the global atom table and APCs, which are async procedure calls. Now, we actually witnessed this uh, being used in the wild by Drydex, uh, the notorious banking trojan. 
Now, atom bombing works by basically having a malicious process store code in the global atom table. Now, this is done by using the global add atom API. And then what we do here is we have a legitimate process. We issue an APC call or an ASIC procedure call to um, the legitimate process and thereby sort of force it to retrieve the code from the, from the atom table and store it in its own memory in a read-write location, at which point we go on to do some uh, return-oriented programming to allocate virtual memory that is executable, copy the memory from the read-write section to the executable memory, and then finally execute the shellcode. Now, all the methods that we've discussed so far, uh, ghostwriting, atom bombing, and the rest, allow you to execute shellcode in a target process. So, Usually, an attacker would want to have their code uh, running inside of a legitimate, very innocent-looking process, which would be either a system-critical process or a process that's used by the user. And so, a crash in the, in the code of the malware could significantly impact the system. If it's in a critical Windows process, then a crash could lead to an even a blue screen. And then, um, if it's in a user application, such as Internet Explorer, then obviously the user is going to notice something. So, it would be very nice if uh, there was an ability to create a process that will host our uh, malicious code, and if it crashes, it doesn't affect anything in the system. And that's why process hollowing was invented. Now, the way process hollowing works is that we first create a legitimate process in a suspended state from something such as SVC host. And now what we have is um, a process that's running in the system, or it's not yet running, but it exists in the system. It will be seen in the, in the task manager, for example. And this process has a process environment block, which points to the main image that is loaded. Now, um, at this point, it's important to note that we also have the EAX register that points to the entry point of the executable, which means that um, once the process starts running, this is the first instruction that's going to execute. So what we go on to do is we unmap the main section, the main image, and so we have sort of a hollowed process. And this is where the method gets its name. Now, at this point, we move on to reallocate the memory for our evil.exe. And then we use this memory that we reallocated to write for each section in our malicious code, we write it into the target, uh, into the container process, at which point we can move on to relocate the image if we need to and set the base address in the process environment block if we changed it. In this example, it's not necessary. And finally, we have to uh, change EAX to point to the, to the co correct entry point by using set thread context. And at this point, all we have left to do is to run the process. And so we resume the thread, and everything works just fine. Now, this technique was useful years ago when it was invented. It was able to bypass a lot of security solutions. But nowadays, vendors are aware of it and are able to block it. That being said, uh, let's talk about how. So the most trivial implementations of process hollowing will create an image that is entirely read-write execute, because it'll allocate everything in one chunk, and it won't correct the protection. And this is easy to detect in numerous ways, so we're not going to get into that. But if the uh, malware authors are a bit more creative, and they don't just copy the first example off of GitHub, but actually implement it themselves, then they'll unmap the executable and then reallocate with correct protection, for example. In which case, first of all, the, mapping of the, main the unmapping of the main executable is highly suspicious. And um, also what we need to understand is there, for every address in Windows, in a process in Windows, we have something called the virtual address descriptor, which is a structure that uh, describes the properties of that address. And the start address of the thread is going to have a, an image map uh, property or an image map type when it's first loaded legitimately. But once the, uh, the threat actor reallocates the memory by unmapping the, the main module, the, the type is going to change. And so we can detect that. Let's say the attackers get even more creative. And they decide to, uh, for example, overwrite the original executable without unmapping it, realizing that this change will not be reflected in the virtual address descriptor. So um, in this case, we need to understand how Windows works when mapping images. Uh, when mapping an image, there's an optimization that makes the pages of the image shared, so that if we load it into multiple processes, then the image is loaded, is shared one time, because we don't want the image 
to be uh, loaded into every process independently and thus taking more memory. So when Windows does this in the something called the PFN database which describes the physical pages of the, that the operating system is working with, um, the pages themselves will be marked as shared. Now once a process tries to write to that page, the page will be turned into a private copy just for that uh, process because it's no longer shared and this change will be reflected in the PFN database. And so the flag that specified pri specifies private or shared will turn from one to zero which means private and this again we can detect. The attacker can get more creative and try to um, unmap and remap, remap the image but again if it's not an executable then the virtual address descriptor is not going to match and the most, uh, the best way to do this to make it look as genuine as possible is by unmapping and remapping an, another file as an actual image in which case first of all the start address of the thread is not going to match the address of entry point of the image that's actually loaded and also the uh, file object that is associated with the process is going to be different from the file object that the virtual address descriptor is pointing to. So process hollowing, not so great anymore given we, what we just saw. The rest of the techniques we talked about which are atom bombing, ghost writing, etc. They are missing this file mapping property, right? They, they create this dynamic code that's, that's, it seems like a runtime generated code and it, that's something that modern solutions nowadays are able to detect because it's highly suspicious. So we need something new. Wouldn't it be cool if we could create a sort of a fileless map file? But we know that AVs scan files. So we need to understand how scanners work very well if we want to try to slip something past them. So for that I'd like to call Eugene to help me out. So we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how uh, the scanners scan the files before they're being uh, executed. Let's consider the generic file uh, execution process. Uh, the begin file is opened and uh, uh, then this section is created out of file and the, uh, the memory is mapped into the uh, memory space of the newly created process and then the execution starts. So various interception can happen. We will cover some places. For example, uh, the uh, file execution can be intercepted during file open process. So usually it's done in the mini filter on the modern windows mm -hmm. during the uh, uh, create a file callback. The second place that can be intercepted by uh, antiviruses is uh, the acquire for a uh, synchronization callback which is called during the section creation before the section is created. And the third place that we will cover today is the process notif uh, creation notification routine which is uh, 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 called just before the process starts execution mm -hmm. and it's uh, in this in its form that, uh, that allows blocking of the execution is available only for a uh, main executable. So before we go further and talk about uh, uh, and see some examples of how antivirus works, uh, uh, let's discuss how uh, what, what should be done once the execution is intercepted. So uh, antivirus have to scan the file and decide if it's malicious or not. So the scanning can be done either from a user mode or from kernel or from any combination of the two. It's up to AV vendor to decide how to scan the file. And the target file that is being executed uh, should be somehow accessed. So it could be opened by name, it could be opened by file ID on some file system that supports it. And uh, of course the, the uh, file object if it's already uh, available could be used, uh, the same file object could be used to scan the file. So again it's up to AV vendor to decide how to how to access the content of the file. Uh, of course, rescanning the file on each change is not practical. If we would do it, the operating system uh, will be on just scanning files. It would be do anything else besides mm -hmm. it. So uh, the AV vendor had, uh, has to decide where to scan the files. So they have some distinct points where they scan the files. Uh, and uh, if we scan the file before it's executes, so it's completely blind for the rest of the thing techniques that we have talked about. So if the content of the, of the memory is changed or uh, somehow file changed and brought into the memory, it's completely uh, invisible for the uh, file, execute, file scanning. So let's see some examples of the uh, real, uh, 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 real stacks taken from uh, uh, well-known vendors. 
So in the first example, we, we can see that the execution is blocked uh, during anti-create process just before the file is opened. Here, a, a antivirus in the mini filter callback blocks the execution. And while it's blocked from the other process, mm -hmm. uh, usually it's a antivirus process, it uh, tries to scan the file by reopening it. We can see from this example that the uh, file is opened by file name. So the file name was taken from the original operation and it's used to reopen the file and scan it. The second example is the section creation. So in this specific example, we can see that the, the Windows Defender, in this case, tries to uh, uh, create a section to scan the file, while other AV vendor blocks it and tries to scan the file before the other scanner uh, do it. And in this case, again, like in the previous case, the operation will be blocked until the file is scanned, and then it will be resumed depending on the uh, content of the file. It's found while issues will be blocked. There's some issue with uh, this specific uh, place, it's called acquire for synchronization, uh, uh, because the mini filter API uh, don't allow us to see all the parameters that is, which, which are passed from the uh, user space. So then we map the section in user space, we have a, 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 a parameter that tells the uh, Windows kernel that we are mapping an image. And we have another option that, uh, which specifies the page protection. Uh, but inside the uh, AV callback, we have only the page protection. We don't have the image type. Uh, this, the, uh, thus, if uh, in the user space we map the image with page read only, for example, uh, the, uh, the Windows will still map the file as executable, but the uh, antiviruses will see only the page read only uh, page protection, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they might decide not to scan the file because they might think that it's. Uh, it's only a data file that's being, being mapped. Of course, the Windows loader will never do it, but if the file is uh, manually loaded into the memory for execution, it can happen. Mm -hmm. And the last place that we would like to cover is the uh, uh, execution. This is not the file scanning. Actually, it's not a file operation. It's actually an execution operation. So uh, here we can see that uh, just after the process was created, the same NT create process routine was blocked. And the, the antivirus uh, would go to, to scan the file ex exactly as it does in the first example. It's important to know that uh, this specific uh, operation is uh, performed uh, it's not, not as part of file operation. So uh, any subsequent uh, changes to, to you know, mappings to, uh, using files will be uh, uh, invisible to this callback. So it's only useful for the main executable because it's uh, in its blocking uh, version. This function is available only for main executable. It cannot be used for dynamic link libraries because it's not available on the older uh, Windows uh, as well. And as I said, it's blind to the uh, for, uh, subsequent changes uh, to the process using files. So it's not an easy job to create an antivirus. We have to decide where to scan the files, how to scan them, uh, there's always a performance uh, considerations and the uh, 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 antivirus vendors have to support different platforms, different CPU types, different file systems, and this makes the work very, very complicated. But we would like to talk about one more layer of complication that the antivirus have to deal with. It's a transactional NTFS. Mm -hmm. So transactional NTFS, also known as uh, TXF for short, uh, was introduced in Windows Vista and it's implemented completely inside the Windows uh, kernel. It uh, works for local NTFS uh, disks. Uh, originally, the Microsoft proposed this solution. They are proposed to use it for a, a multiple file updates that has to be performed as an atomic operation. Either all the changes would be committed to the disk or would be rolled back, depends on the result of the uh, operation. It can be used as part of the larger transaction involving other applications, but it's out of the scope of uh, this talk. And uh, usually this is used uh, for uh, installation processes. You can, uh, you can think of installation that changes a lot of files during the installation process, and then if something happens, files have to be rolled back. Instead of writing a lot of code that rolled back the files, then the installer just can roll back the transaction and every changes would disappear. It's a very nice feature. But uh, just before we continue, uh, you can, uh, this were taken from the Storage Developer Conference back from 2009. You can see that this, uh, this was a, a very major change to the kernel code. 
uh, a large part of uh, NTFS driver was written to support transaction. We have a lot of new functions. We will talk about them a little bit later. And a lot of uh, functions that were exist previously were changed to support transactions. So we have a really huge change in the specific area of kernel, and it was deprecated. It was deprecated uh, very shortly after mm -hmm. it was uh, it was proposed by Microsoft. And if you look to the end of the you, you just see not I don't use it anymore. And as usually happens, these deprecated features they're still used. Not used, they're used by Microsoft in stories up to today. The latest Windows update will use transactions. So let's see some API. Before we start, we just have to uh, remind you that transactions have a, sp a special function. So they, the application ha has to be sp sp designed to use transactions. They, they not, don't come uh, out of nothing. They have, we have to create transaction using transaction function. We usually end the transaction using transaction uh, commit or rollback, depends on what we want to achieve. Uh, for functions in the I.O. that uh, works with file names, we have a special function which ends this transacted uh, word, and uh, this function, uh, in addition to the regular, uh, regular options, takes the one more option, which is trans handle to transactions. So we open transaction, then we can access the, the file by its name you, uh, inside the transaction, and all other functions which works with file handles will just work, work also with transactions. So let's see some example. In this example, we create a transaction. We create a file inside the transaction, Let's say it's a new file. We write inside this file and we close the file. So if if it uh, would be a regular file and uh, if you would go to the directory uh, with uh, Microsoft Explorer, we will see this. We would see this file. But because this file is created inside the transaction, it's completely invisible for the application outside the transaction until we commit the transaction. So no, only now when we commit the transaction, the changes can be observed by other applications. At the end, we have to close the transaction handle. So. That will continue from here. So, so what do we have so far? We talked about history of evasion techniques. We talked about um, the inner workings of AV scanners and all the different factors to consider when, when implementing one. We talked about NTFS transactions. And you must be wondering what's next. Well, naturally, transactions make life very hard for AV vendors. Now, what we want to do is we want to leverage this and try to create a process from a transacted file. That being said, the Windows loader, as most of us know, only accepts, the Windows process loader only accepts a file path to create a, a process. And we don't have an API create process transacted. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to dive into the process creation process on Windows and try to see if we can find a way to somehow create a process out of a transacted file. So um, comparing the create process function between uh, Windows XP and Windows 10. Superficially, we get the impression that Microsoft changed completely how processes are created. But if you look deeper into it, then, then you see that Microsoft moved most of the code from the user mode library kernel 32 to the NT kernel itself. And somehow, the function in kernel 32 became longer. Um, logically, the steps remain mostly the same. But let's take a look at the process loader on uh, Windows XP. Now, we're going to take a look at this in assembly code. But for those of you who don't know assembly, it's OK. The words are pretty clear. And I'm going to explain every step as we go along. So as we can see, the first step is we call an internal routine, which goes on to open the file. So we open the file here we, with a few permissions that we're asking for the file. And if that fails, then we try to open the file again with less permissions, which is, I guess, something that all of us do in our code sometimes. At this point, we create a section. A section is an object that can be later mapped into memory. Now, the thing to note here is that the type of allocation is sec image, while the page protection is page execute. Now, as Eugene said before, this is how the Windows loader does it, but nothing prevents an attacker from passing a parameter of section, of, uh, section page protection of page read only, which could cause the antivirus to skip the scan altogether. At this point, we call the kernel to create the process object, to create the new process. Now, uh, the thing to note here is that we use the section handle that we opened before. So the steps are we create the file, we create the section, and then we create the process from the section. 
So the file has already been opened at this point. Now the kernel, what it does is creates the process object using the create object routine of the object manager and then adds the process to the list of running processes. At this point, we move on to talk about something called the process parameters. Now, process parameters are a structure that every process has on Windows, and it's crucial for the ability of a process to run. Without this, the process cannot run. And it contains, it contains stuff like the command line of the process and that kind of thing. Now, um, at this point on Windows XP, we can see that we have a subroutine called base push process parameters, which what it does is it creates the process parameters, allocates memory in the new process for the parameters, copies the parameters to the target process, to the newly created process, and then finally sets the address of the parameters in the process environment block. Now, the important thing to note here is this happens after the process is created, and it's implemented entirely in user mode. And we'll see why this is different in just a second when we take a look at Windows 10. At this point, we create the thread for the process, the main thread. And if the flag specified, we resume the execution of the thread. And that's it for Windows XP. Now, if we compare this to Windows 10, we still have the same subroutine that's inside. And we, we can note that the first thing that happens here is that um, the, the first function that's called is base create process parameters, which creates the parameters. We can see the parameters being created and filled out with some data. But this happens before opening the file, before creating the section, before a process even exists. At this point, we call this new system call. It's not that new. It was introduced in Windows Vista. But um, it's this, uh, this, subroute, uh, this uh, system call called anti-create user process is, does not accept a section handle like the one in Windows XP did. It actually expects a file path. And the kernel opens the path for us. Um, the other thing to note here is that the process parameters are being passed to the kernel as opposed to Windows XP when this was copied post process creation in the user space code. So if we take a look at the kernel routine, we can see that uh, we try to open the file in kernel as opposed to Windows XP when it was a user mode. If it fails, then we try again, of course. Well, then we create the section, just like in Windows XP, except now it's happening in kernel. At this point, we copy the process parameters from user mode to kernel mode. And then we move on to call the uh, allocate process routine, which, again, calls the create object routine to create the actual process object, allocates virtual memory for the process parameters, copies the parameters to the new process, and then sets the value in the process environment block. From this point on, there's not much left. We are allocating the main thread. We insert the main, the process and the thread into the respective lists. At this point, the uh, process create notify routine that Eugene mentioned earlier is called. And we leave the kernel. And if we need to, we resume the thread according to the creation flag specified. OK. So to highlight the main differences, in Windows 10, we have NT-Create User Process being used instead of NT-Create Process EX. Now, NT-Create Process EX receives a handle to a section, while NT-Create User Process receives a file path. Luckily for us, NT-Create Process EX is still available in the latest Windows 10 release because it's used in the creation of minimal processes, which is a bit beyond the scope of this talk. Now, the only thing is, unfortunately, the all the supporting user mode code that we had in XP is no longer available for us. So what we need to do is we need to implement the, the heavy lifting on our own, by ourselves, by creating it ourselves. Let's talk about doppelganging. So our goal here is to load and execute an arbitrary executable inside the context of a legitimate process. And we want to use none of the suspicious uh, process hollowing API calls, such as unmap view of section, virtual protect, set thread context, APCs, and that kind of thing. We want AV to scan only clean files or to not even scan us at all. And we don't want to be discovered by uh, advanced forensics tools. So we break doppelganging into four steps. Step number one, transact. Step number two, load. Step number three, rollback. And step number four, animate, which brings the doppelganger to life. 
Let's take a look at step number one, transact. First off, we create a transaction, just in the example that Eugene showed before with a simple transaction-aware application. At this point, we open a file that is a legitimate file, such as SVC host, inside of a transaction. So we have a nice, green, clean-looking file object that we just opened, and it's opened inside of a transaction. What we're going to do now is we're going to overwrite the file inside of a transaction, and now it's tainted with malicious code. The only thing to note here is that anyone looking at this file from the outside doesn't see our changes. They're reflected only within the context of the transaction context. Step number two, load. What we do at this point is we create a memory section from the uh, tainted file. And so we have a newly allocated section object that contains all the malicious code that we wrote to the file. At this point, we can move on to rollback, which is as we talked about before, when you're working with transactions, when you're done, you need to decide if you want to commit the transaction and save the files to the disk, or if you want to roll them back because you ran into some kind of error. In our example, we have no interest in committing the transaction because we don't want anybody to see the changes we made to the file. So what we're going to do here is we're going to roll back the transaction. The file becomes green again and clean, and this really effectively removes all of our um, writes from the file system. Now. We move on to step number four, animate. Using the uh, details we found out before from examining the Windows process loader, we can um, call the NT-CreateProcessEx routine that was used in Windows XP to create a process from the section that, is create, that we created. And so once we do that, we now have a green process, a nice clean looking process that's running our or hosting our malicious sec section. At this point, we create the, th the thread of the uh, for the main, the main thread, and we move on to do all the heavy lifting that we need to do that Windows XP's uh, user time libraries, libraries used to do for us, which is to create the process parameters, to fill them, up with the, to fill them out with the correct, uh, correct uh, parameters, to allocate memory for the parameters, to copy it into the uh, doppelganger process, and then to set it in the PB of the doppelganger. And then finally, all that's left to do is resume the execution run the process. And now we have a nice green process that's running and the AVs will not take a look at it. So let's see this live in a demo. I have here a virtual machine that, uh, as you can see, it's running Windows Defender on the very updated uh, definitions, December 7th, that's today. Um, and what I'm going to do here is we have this uh, password dumping tool that should be well known to everyone. And while we don't really think this is a hacking tool on our own or on its own, Windows Defender seems to think so. So let's try to double click it and see what happens. Virus and threat protection, threats found. So Windows Defender found threats. Obviously, the executable did not run. Now, what we're going to try to do is we're going to create a doppelganger of MS Paint, which is the uh, Windows utility for making nice little drawings. And we're going to have this actually execute the same uh, tool, except this time it's going to read the tool from disk in an encrypted form so that Defender cannot um, scan it. And let's see if Defender has any problems with this, uh, with this action. At this point, the tool was executed. This is a fully functional tool. It can be used, and as you can see, Windows Defender doesn't seem to mind. Process Explorer can help us take a look at what's going on here. Maybe we can figure out. If we take a look and, and take a look at the process, we can see that we have MS Paint running, and there's nothing here showing us that it's actually um, a different tool that's being hosted inside this process. It actually even preserved the icon, which is really interesting. If we even try to verify, it'll say that the, this is verified. So that's really nice. Thank you. Um, so while uh, conducting this research, the first time this thing, um, we ran this thing on Windows 7, and it worked just fine. Um, and then we ran it on Windows 10, and the system crashed. And so it turns out that there's a bug that was introduced in Windows Redstone and reported by James Fershaw. And uh, it's a null pointer to reference, so the 
NT create process EX when it receives a zero is one of the parameters, it tries to dereference it without checking first, and so the system uh, crashes for, for an access violation. And luckily for us, though, Microsoft was nice enough to fix it for this talk because uh, it, the bug was introduced in Redstone a while back and fixed in the false creators update two months ago. So if this lecture was taking place two months ago, we couldn't do it on the most recent Windows 10 release, but now we can, so thanks. <laughs> Um, the affected products of process doppelganging are the following that we tested. We tested all these. They were all bypassed. What we did is we took the executable, such as the tool we showed before. Uh, we saw that the antivirus flags this as an executable. When we double click it, then we loaded it as a doppelganger and it was able to run with no problems. If we want to talk detection and prevention, then um, first of all, it's not so easy, but um, a simple way to, to go about this is to scan the file object available in the create process notification routine and to use the exact object, not to reopen the file. And if you get an error while trying to do it, then you know doppelganging is taking place, so you, could, you should block it. About DLL files, this doesn't help. Um, so what you can do here is try to scan all sections, even data sections, because as we saw, the flags in the minifilter callback are, um, are actually misleading. Um, as for forensics, if you want to detect a process in retrospect that has been doppelganged, you can take a look at the file object of the associated with the process, and if it has the right access enabled, then, um, then you can know that something fishy is going on here, and there's a good chance it's uh, process, process doppelganging. And also, uh, specifically on Windows 10, the e-process structure has something called the image file pointer, which is supposed to point to the file object, and this, doesn't ex this will be null in a doppelgang process. Um, to sum up, uh, process doppelganging allows us to take a malicious executable, load it in the context of a legitimate looking file, and create a process out of it. We use the Windows loader, right? So there's no need for a custom reflective loader of any sort. The file is mapped to an image file correctly on disk, just like any legit process. And we don't have any of the unma uh, unmapped, dynamically generated runtime code that is, that is usually associated with modern malware and is detected by modern solutions. This can be used to, can be leveraged to uh, doppelgang DLL files as well, and it's completely fileless. And even advanced forensics tools such as Volatility won't detect it at this point. Um, this works on all Windows versions starting Vista and bypasses all these solutions that we tested the security solutions. We'd like to give a special thanks to Omri Misgev and Udi Avo, who helped us a lot with this research, and without them it wouldn't be possible, so thank you guys. And thank you all for coming and listening, and at this point, if you have any questions, we'd love to address them. All right. What are the questions that you would like to ask them? Thank you for the talk. Um, I have one question just to uh, double check if I understand it correctly. With this technique, when you execute the uh, malicious code, it will have all the privileges the process you are using for that will normally have, right? So for example, if that was the MS Paint and I'm executing my malicious code, it will be able to do anything which the, the MS Paint process would be able to do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's running with like MS Paint. The process gets the token just like MS Paint, but mm -hmm. um, it, it all depends in Windows on the context on which the process was created. So if it was created by a, an unprivileged uh, process, then it won't have privileges. If it's created by a privileged process, then it could do anything. Thank you. Next question. Thanks for presentation. Uh, I just have one question. Did you guys uh, investigate it, like um, this transactions API that you used on Windows? Like, does it have any kind of um, memory implications, so like where you create a file and transaction should be created somewhere, right? So maybe these uh, like implications are detectable. Okay, so that is, they, they're actually written to 
to the file system in, uh, in, spe in special files. And the details of this can be read about online on uh, MSDN. It's uh, documented. Uh, hello. Um, my question is, uh, what about access rights? Uh, is, are the, the rights checked just after committing or uh, at the beginning of the create transacted uh, file? Can you spoof also a process that is unavailable to you? No, I, I don't follow. Sorry. The, the binary. There, there was an example about uh, svchost.exe. Yes. Uh, what if it's a protected process that's unavailable to, for example, you don't have rights to read it? Oh, so you, you mean on the file system level? I don't. Yeah, have, yeah. I, I don't have access to it. So no, if I can't open the file, then I can't do anything to it. Yeah. But in theory, I could just copy the file somewhere and then, and then do it from there. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else has a question? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, what about code signing uh, and uh, executive uh, signing, uh, like certificates for 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 executive piece, executive bubbles? <laughs> Sorry. So, as we saw in the demo, if you took a look um, in Process Explorer, for example, which tries to verify the digital signature of the process that's being executed, so it looks legitimate. But if you take a look in memory at what's running, if you investigate this at runtime. Then, uh, then obviously you'll you'll be able to tell that something happened, so it, the the signature will not match. We still have time. If you have any other questions, thank you for your. Lecture. Uh, one question about uh, does uh, the app locker prevent this? Does the app locker check the memory contents or does it verify on the disk? So that's a good question, and I actually am not sure about that because we didn't take a look at app locker in this uh, in this uh, research. We mostly focused on um, on bypassing security solutions uh, by seeing that they don't uh, they incorrectly handle transactions. So I don't have the answer for that. Next question. We still have 10 minutes. Um, I was wondering, have you gotten any response on this from Microsoft? Uh, is it, will it be patched somehow? So we, we've actually disclosed this to Microsoft and uh, they didn't deem it as a vulnerability, which it's not. The, the operating system is behaving as it should. The only thing, the only thing here maybe that they could, they could change um, is to add to, in the minute filter called back, you could, you could tell the, the antivirus that a section is being created for execution even when you can kind of fool it uh, into skipping that. But other than that, there's not much uh, Microsoft could or should be doing. It's, it's the antiviruses who should handle transaction correctly. Thank you. So to that point uh, about Microsoft not considering this uh, vulnerability, uh, are there legitimate cases where you would use transactions here for creating executables? So that, that should really, it shouldn't happen because as we saw the, the Windows process loader, uh, the official exported API, it only accepts file paths. There's no way to run a file out of a transaction. It's only using the system calls directly uh, that enables us to create a process from, from a handle. We take the handle to a file, we create a section, and then from the section we create the process. But that is something that the Windows loader is in charge of doing. And as you saw in Windows 10, this no longer even happens in user mode. It, it happens in kernel mode. It's just that the, uh, the old system call is still available. 
Okay, so then the real question is, why do they persist that old method? Why, why does it still exist? Yeah. So it's a bit beyond this scope, but the general idea is that um, NT create user process creates a, pro a Windows process, while um, NT create process is just a relatively much thinner wrapper around the uh, function that creates the object of a process. And so it can be used to create a minimal process, which doesn't have a lot of things that a normal process does. And it can be used in running um, things like other subsystems on Windows, such as, uh, for example, the WSL, the Windows system over Linux, which can be used uh, to create these types of processes, which are not normal Windows processes. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Uh, so this is a follow-up question of uh, a question what, that was asked before. Um, uh, so you, they asked you for a reaction from Microsoft, but did you get also some reaction from the antivirus software companies? Yeah, so antivirus software companies um, have been aware of this issue. It's, it's online. If you look up uh, antivirus plus transactions, you'll see that it's, it's a known fact that they don't handle transactions correctly. They, they, they're aware of this issue. They just uh, haven't... Uh, taking care of it yet, and that, that's what we're trying to show here, is that uh, even 11 years after this, this feature was introduced, fully documented, and, and, and people have discussed online that, that um, antiviruses don't handle transactions well, still 11 years later, and all the antiviruses can be bypassed using this technique. Does anyone else has a question? Uh, thanks for the good talk. Um, I was wondering if this could be used in a way with uh, executables which elevate automatically, which are signed by Microsoft. So say you pass the parameter of a process, well, for example, in your example, you pass a parameter for a executable that you want to elevate and you said it uh, inherits the, is it the security descriptor of the other, the process which you, the post process? So could that be used for like process elevation or? Yeah, so you're talking about auto elevating processes, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, an, okay. that's a very good question. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's something that actually uh, we've, we've dealt with in the past. You can see on uh, breaking malware on our blog, we, we actually did, uh, some US, UAC bypasses using exactly um, what we did specifically is we used a, an auto elevating process and we changed the environment for it so it loads our DLL. But, so this could actually be potentially used for this, but it's, we haven't gotten around to, to testing that yet, but it's on our to-do list. All right, thank you. If you still have a question, we still have time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you still have time, guys, yeah? Yeah, um, we're done. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys.